The children of Israel had been at Mount Sinai for a very long time. According to the book of Numbers, they camped out there for 11 months, five days. And what a year, or nearly a year, that had been. Oh, it had not all been good. Nobody wanted to talk about the whole golden calf incident. But Sinai had also been a place where God had been present for them like they had never experienced before. Thunder and lightning had flashed down from the top of the mountain. And people had swore they had heard a heavenly voice booming from the clouds. The elders had gone up the slopes of the mountain and eaten a covenant meal with Yahweh, with God's self. But most of all, it had been at Sinai that the law code that would be so central to the life and identity of the people had been given them. Down the slopes of that mountain, Moses had carried the two tablets inscribed with the Ten Commandments, central to the body of law that would guide them into the future. Sinai had been amazing. But now it was time to leave. And all the laws and the lessons of Sinai were about to be put to the test as they entered back into the real world. And it's one thing to talk about these kinds of matters in theory, but it's quite another to deal with living them out in cold, harsh reality. So I can hardly blame Moses for the way we see him talking at the beginning of our reading this morning. If your presence will not go, he says, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? Moses seems genuinely afraid. He is about to head out towards something new, but everything on the, that he has learned on the mountain is about to be put to the test. And Moses knows he's not going to make it unless the God he's come to know on this mountain will be with him. And I understand exactly where Moses is coming from. Anytime we do that, anytime we begin to break away from a place where we have learned so much that has been formative to our identity, and we head out to something new, it's natural for us to seek some reassurance. I remember, for example, the first summer I didn't go to Glenmore camp. Now, Glenmore is a Presbyterian church camp uh, up in Muskoka today part of a larger group of camps collectively known as Camp Cairn. And for many years of my life, Camp Glenmore was a huge part of my summer. First as a camper, later as a staff member, I learned so much there. So much that cemented my Christian identity, my personal identity. And I remember the year when I was too old, basically, to go anymore. It was like I was missing a piece of myself, and I, I didn't know what to do with myself. Oh, I'm, I was fine, but I felt so lost for a little while. I was looking for some reassurance. And it feels like we're in a time like that in the church today. The Christian church has enjoyed a long and stable history in Western society. Mainline churches like the Presbyterian Church in Canada have learned so much about how to live as Christians within this society. We've written endless books of theology and, and classics of Christian life that contain so much truth. And of course, we've developed these wonderful, beautiful traditions that we've handed down for decades. But it seems as if we are learning that time of stable learning. Things are changing rapidly for the church, not just because of COVID, though, of course, that's a huge challenge, but also because of the rapid change of our society in which we find ourselves. And it increasingly feels as if we're heading out into uncharted territory, out into a place where we're going to have to put to work the lessons we have learned in this stable place, in the real world. And it may not be very easy. So yeah, we could very well say along with Moses, if your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. We'd rather stay where we are. 
But the good news that I have to share with you today is that God is responsive to Moses' request. So also, I believe God will be responsive to ours. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And God's promises are reliable. Moses knew. We can know that too. And yet Moses at the same time knew that he needed more. He needed to know what would provide for him that reassurance and of God's presence as he moved on. He needed something big, something unmistakable. Show me your glory, I pray, he cried. Now that is what I call a big ask. The glory of the Lord is described in the scripture as this unmistakable sign of God's presence. In a vision, Ezekiel describes the glory of the Lord as a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually and in the middle of the fire something like glowing amber. Moses was looking for something impressive, something unmistakable to go with him. And I think that's what we often look for as well. Thinking that, that through such open displays, God could make it so much easier for us to follow God. And I believe that God understands this desire we have for such things, but God knows that it really doesn't work like that. You cannot see my face, he says, for no one shall see me and live. Now, I can't claim that I really understand this whole idea that humans can't stand to see the face of God. On one level, it seems that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? To have all of the answers and all of the certainty about life and the universe and everything handed to us on a silver platter. So we might never doubt it. But I guess the problem is that we humans don't really handle that kind of certainty very well. Certainly notice that among those who are certain about something they believe. They seem to be the ones who are most likely to hurt and abuse others because of belief. I really don't think that we as human beings are designed to have all of the answers. We thrive, actually, in that quest to understand and interpret the world around us. If we knew the absolute truth, I think there's a real sense that we couldn't handle it. So God says, no, no, Moses, I'm not going to lay it all out for you that way, in a way that settles everything. But God does say what he will do for Moses. And I think it's what God will do for us as well. Here's what God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And will proclaim before you the name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. God here promises to tell Moses and us God's name. Now, what does that mean? Well, it obviously means more than what you mean when you tell somebody else what your name is. This name that God is promising to tell Moses, the name that is translated as the Lord, is a Hebrew word, Yahweh. This is considered to be the true and powerful name of God in the Bible. Two syllables considered to be so holy that a Jew would not dare to even pronounce them aloud. From what it says in this passage, it seems clear that this holy name is like a perfect expression of the character of God and it, that it particularly reflects God's grace. By proclaiming this name, God is declaring to Moses that he will be gracious and he will be merciful in his dealings with the people. Not because anyone's forcing God to do that though, but simply because that's what God's true nature is. And I think that this is uh, definitely something we need to hold on to as we head out into the unknown. We may have many uncertain times ahead of us, 
but at such things at such times no matter what else is uncertain there is one thing that we can just know we can know that we can trust in god's never failing love that god will be there for us when we need god most because that's simply who god is it's god's character next god says this to moses see there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock and while my glory passes by i will put you in a cleft of the rock and i will cover you with my hand until i have passed by here we see that not only god's grace but also god's glory is at work in the world and yet moses is strangely sheltered from seeing it while it's happening god seems to to be taking tender care of moses as if he's being protected from seeing it all by God's own hand. I believe this reflects the fact that we often do not actually see God at work in the world while that work is ongoing. When God is at work, the result of that work is often disruptive. God's calls for justice, for example, often lead to reactions like, like protests and maybe civil disobedience. Activities that in their nature are designed to stir up chaos, to make people feel uncomfortable. And yet they're exactly the kinds of actions that are sometimes necessary to bring about genuine change. Chaos and disorder have this effect of making us feel bad, nervous, or upset. Because nobody likes to have their comfortable lives disturbed by such things. And I think this is exactly why we often fail to recognize God at work in the world. We become focused on, on what's making us feel easy. And so we find it difficult to look at the bigger picture of what's going on. But this passage in Exodus suggests that this might actually be by design, that, that God is covering us over with God's hand at such time to spare us these difficult transitions. But for this or for whatever reason, yes, it's difficult for us to perceive the great works of God that God performs while they are happening. And this is why God offers one more reassurance to Moses. Once God has passed by Moses, as he stands in the cleft of the rock, this promise is given. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back but my face shall not be seen. What does that mean? I think it means that we may not always understand exactly what God is doing in the world while that work is ongoing. But here's the promise. We will be able to look back afterwards and realize that yes, yes, God has passed this way. And I think that's how God commonly reveals God's presence to us. We can often only see where and how God is at work in the world after the events have passed. And we can look back and see what has happened, what the impact might be. And I think that is something that is a particular comfort for us right now with everything that's going on. As we contemplate, you know, the deadly impact of a virus, as we look at a lot of this political chaos that seems to overflow from the United States, as we watch meaningful and yet very disruptive protests in the streets, it's easy to become discouraged and to think only that everything's spiraling out of control, things are only getting worse. But I suspect these feelings of helplessness we have at such times are there because God is hiding us within the cleft of the rock for our own safety. But the day will come and it will come soon when God, what God has been working on quietly in the dark is brought out into the light and the hope that results will be for all. And I believe we will be able to look back to these very days and recognize exactly what God has been doing and what God does is good and bright and life affirming. Yeah, it's hard. Hard to move forward at a time like this. Everything seems so uncertain. There are no guarantees. 
But I hope you will take comfort in knowing that sometime soon we will be able to understand, maybe by looking back, but we will understand exactly what the name of the Lord is, the one who is gracious and merciful, because that is God's nature. <coughs> Let's take a few moments in silent prayer. Gracious God, we thank you, we praise you, you are the living God. And yeah, the world might seem kind of out of control right now. The events that are passing are overwhelming. We may not be able to perceive all you're doing right now, but we thank you. We confess with faith that you are alive and at work. And when you remove your hand, help us to look back and perceive your great works in this world as they continue and to be part of what you are doing. Amen. <clears throat>